All right, hello there, thrill seekers. And before I go any further, I better tell you that I will be at Hokyoji Zen Monastery from February 12th to February 18th as part of their winter practice period. It's going to be a sashin, so intensive zazen practice for, uh, is it five days or seven days? I'm not sure. Count them up yourself and figure it out. That's in Minnesota, by the way. I forgot to say that. And if you want more information about how to join, you can write an email to them. The email address is hokyoji at hokyoji.org. Yesterday, I talked a little bit about antidepressants and Zen. And I wanted to talk more generally about depression in Zen. And I thought, I made a video about this and I went and checked. And in, on May 9th, 2018, I made a video called uh, Zen and Depression or Depression in Zen. And I'm going to put that video back up so it'll be up on my channel twice in case people missed it. And so I'll try to have that up the same day that I put this one up. But I want to make a new video too. So these videos are going to overlap. I'm going to say kind of the same thing in both videos, but maybe in a slightly different way because I've had five years to reflect on the subject. So to start off, I wanted to read to you some comments that I got about my previous video. Okay, the first one is titled part one nope and came with this big emoji on it so i'm going to read you that comment alternatively consider this there are millions of people prescribed meds for long-term debilitating conditions commonly called chronically mentally ill or cmi for cmi these symptoms are organic deficits in all caps in neurological functioning the psychotropics cmis are typically prescribed and often often return CMIs to baseline, in quotes. In many cases, one might describe this correction as a normative state, in quotes, especially when it uh, when combined with therapy. They create new neural pathways to devour, sorry, to de detour, I almost read devour, detour cognitive distortions and maladaptive behaviors. I appreciate, Brad, that you repeatedly said that you're not qualified to give advice, but the question ponders whether psychotropics blunt, block, or prohibit Kensho experiences. For CMI people, mood disorders are nothing, in big letters, like headache over like a headache over which you uh, drop a couple of pills and the conditions pass. Neither is it a crutch. Imagine your headache as a repeated series of blood clots. Suppose these clots affect your cognition. Next, suppose your doctor prescribed you a blood thinner to reduce the risk of future clots forming. If you stop taking the blood thinner, the deficit of your body's maladaptive nature will revert back to clotting. Surely you'd take it forever at the risk of your frontal lobe suffocating, right? Even if you wouldn't, if someone with the same situation situation resolved themselves to the fact that they'd have to take blood thinners for the rest of their days, it would be a mischaracterization to call them addicts, wouldn't it? This is, in, in big letters, what it's like for the majority of CMIs with bona fide mood disorders. Antidepressants are not happy pills that turn you into sunshine Sally. We must stop perpetuating ignorance on this issue, with two exclamation points. Given the right dosage negates detrimental perversions and cognitive distortions that thwart normative functioning. And then here's in all caps. What this means is that CMIs on appropriate long-term meds are more likely, not less, to allow for authentic Kensho experiences because, now back to regular letters, uh, their medications stabilize neural deficits that result in distortion. Uh, please limit your statements to Kensho experiences and, and things you have direct experience of, and etc, etc. Okay, that's one. And then I got another one, which I won't read you in full. Um, he says that uh, antidepressants are not like narcotics or alcohol. They're more like insulin. Diabetics take insulin because their bodies don't produce enough uh, to naturally keep functioning. Uh, they're going to have to take insulin forever because there's something about their bodies that literally isn't working to sustain life. But insulin isn't a foreign chemical like alcohol that gets into your system. Uh, antidepressants, at least for common ones, are similar, uh, etc. And someone said, as someone who's been on antidepressants for 15 plus years, this, which, uh, what I just read you, sounds accurate. The intent of antidepressants is to bring your neural chemicals levels to a baseline in order to restore normative mental functioning. Uh, sometimes a temporary course is all that's needed, but sometimes it's uh, a long-term course, etc. Okay, so that's, you got the gist of the comments, and I'm not, no matter what I say in the rest of the video, I am not trying to deny what those comments said. 
Okay, so try to keep that in mind, that I'm not arguing with you. I just want to state, I just want to talk to, about my own experience. The first commenter said that, that the meds are more likely to allow for authentic Kensho experiences. Well, you see, this is kind of the thing. As far as Kensho experiences go, I think it's a lot more to do with karma than anything else, than any other factor. Uh, and whether you believe in karma or not, I do, but <laughs> you, you might not. Anyway, and I don't think whether you take the meds or don't take the meds or, or, or much else really matters. Uh, to phrase it the way Ramesh Balsakar, who was a student of Nisargadatta Maharaj, always puts things, if it is the will of God and the destiny of the body-mind organism to have these experiences, you'll have them. Otherwise, you won't. So as far as talking about things that are in my direct experience, let's do that for a minute. One of the things uh, two commenters did is compare these antidepressants to insulin taken by diabetics. So I guess this is a common uh, trope. I have a friend uh, named Bob. Uh, his real name is Bob, but I'm not going to give you his last name because, uh, because we, don't, we don't do that here. And he's, uh, he's, got, uh, he's severely diabetic. Like he's not just one of these people who has a, a little bit of a problem. He has a, he has a, a pretty uh, a pretty bad problem with diabetes. Now he made the decision a long time ago that he's not going to take insulin. What this means, though, is he has to be extremely disciplined and extremely on this problem all the time. Uh, whenever I've been with him, he's jugging gallons of water. It seems like. Uh, he's, he does this exercise routine that he will not, he, he won't slack off for even a day. Uh, he's very, very careful about what he eats. There's probably some other things he does that I, I don't even know about. But this, this affects his whole life. So he's got to spend his, his he's got to really, you know, do this. So I also have another friend who's uh, severely diabetic and his name is Dave. His real name is Dave. I'm not going to give his last name. Uh, he doesn't have the kind of discipline that Bob does, and his diabetes, got, well, he, he drank himself silly one night, ended up in a diabetic coma, uh, he lives alone, he wasn't found for a day or two, and by the time he f they found him, a lot of damage had been done, and Dave's never been the same since. So, okay, this is two extremes, and I think these two extreme cases are probably true for most of us who suffer from depression. So let me tell you about my depression, which is the thing I did on that other video, which you can go and watch, and you want to see how I described it five years ago. I, I think I've described it, I would describe it pretty much the same. I watched the video just now, and I, I feel like it's pretty much the same. Depression for me, okay, there's two kinds of depression. This is just my unexpert opinion, not an expert opinion, just my personal uh, experience of it, is there's two types of depression. One is, I don't know, you lose your job and y y your wife uh, leaves you to date your dad or something like that, you know, something terrible like that happens and you get depressed. And I, I f suffer that kind of depression just like anybody else. There's this other kind of depression that I've suffered from all my life, and it took years to kind of recognize the pattern of it. But it basically just comes out of nowhere. Poof. Like, there's nothing specifically to get depressed about, but I'm just like, Ugh. and it comes in waves that can last Lately, they usually last a few days. In the past, they've lasted months or probably even years, where the depression will just kind of go down and down and down until I reach a point where I feel like I, I just can't take it anymore. And lately, over the past maybe 15 or even 20 years, what usually happens is when I hit the lowest point, that's when it, it breaks. And to give you an example, uh, I'm a little bit reluctant to jinx it by talking too much about it, but I was going through one of those and it kind of broke uh, yesterday or a day before yesterday. And I'm hoping it stays broken, <laughs> but it, it came out of nowhere and 
you know, all the stuff happens, like suicidal ideation and, and just just dark. I don't enjoy anything. I don't want to do anything or go anywhere. I don't want to talk to anybody. I'm just in this deep fog. And I've learned, I think my Zen practice has been really useful in learning how to deal with this and how to function even in spite of it. And one of the things that the Zen practice did, the most useful thing it ever did for me, and I used to say this all the time and I stopped saying it, but uh, what I learned is my thoughts are just thoughts. So what would happen in earlier times with these depression that came out of nowhere is the depression would trigger a lot of thoughts and the thoughts could get darker and darker and darker and the thoughts sort of built up the, on themselves and became another source of the depression. So there was the depression that came out of nowhere and then there was the thoughts that kind of creeped up on it and, and built it up into this huge fog which was very intense. My supposition, though I've never been checked by a doctor for this or I've never gone to a doctor or a psychiatrist for depression, but my suspicion is that the second kind of depression I described for you is probably the, the chemical one that a lot of people take antidepressants for. Uh, maybe it's a low serotonin level, I have no idea. But it just seems to come up out of nowhere, as I say, even if things are going pretty great. It'll just go bleh and get me. So in that case, in, in that sense, it's a bit like a cold. What I've learned not to do is not to add thought to depression and not to believe my thoughts. So if I have a suicidal thought, and this is what I said in the previous video, but I'm going to repeat it because it, it, I think it was a pretty good analogy. Uh, it used to be that I would believe that thought because I thought that thought came from me and I thought I was that thought and that thought must be real. Now I observe those thoughts as I would if somebody walked, you know, if I'm walking on a crowded street and somebody came up, you know, beside me and said, hey, you should kill yourself and walked on, I'd be like, yeah, I'm not going to do that. It's just like, it's it's a noise that comes up and I realize that the, the noises in my head are not me. They don't come from me. They, they're just, they're probably affected by a lot of things you think that your thoughts are something you produce. At least that's what I thought before. And if you observe them enough, or as I've observed them enough, let's stick to me here. As I've observed them over the years, I realize that my thoughts don't belong to me. Now, when I first noticed that, it was a shock. I mean, somebody can tell you this. Somebody can tell you it in a video or you can read it in a book. And I did that a lot. I wasn't watching videos when I was young because I reckon those days we didn't have no YouTube. But, you know, I'd hear it in lectures about Buddhism or I'd hear it from my teacher or I'd read it in a book. And I understood it intellectually. It took a long time and a lot of work before I understood it experientially, like right down in my bones. And I went, whoa. It's true. My thoughts are just thoughts. And they can be affected by anything. Like any anything, a temperature inversion or, a, I don't know, air pressure changes. You, you just don't know. Diet, I think, is a, is a huge factor in this. There, there's all kinds of things can make your body do stuff that manifests in your brain as a thought. And you don't have any control over it. Sam Harris, who I think is a joke these days, but he said one thing that is really useful, and he said, I can no more predict my own next thought than I can predict your next thought. And I thought that's, that's a good way of putting it, because you can't try to predict your next thought. 
I mean, you can do you can do a little bit of manipulation of your thoughts, and and that's what I would do, and that's what made my depression worse. But for the most part, the the thought process itself is outside of any sort of conscious control. It's probably even less controllable than breathing. I mean, breathing is an unconscious act, but you can go and hold your breath for a little while. You can kind of hold your thoughts for a little while. I've found that I can hold my thoughts for about as long as I can hold my breath. It does, you know, that's about it. And then they just start blah, 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 up and, uh, you know, piling up. And the Zen trick, if there is one, is to learn to just see your thoughts as thoughts and just go, that's just another thing and I don't believe it and I don't have to accept it as real and, and it's fine. Now, having said that, it's not for everybody. You know, just like my friend Bob manages his diabetes without insulin and my friend Dave, well, he never tried to manage it without insulin, but he just doesn't have any, even enough uh, self-discipline to take the insulin, you know, let alone try to manage his diet and exercise all the time and all the rest of it. And uh, it, it was bad for him. It's probably the same with depression. If you are able to commit to a really, really disciplined sort of lifestyle, you might be able to control your depression the, the way I've dealt with mine. Now, I don't know. I can't compare my depression to your depression. There's no, there's no, you know, this is something that comes up in, in Zen a lot when people try to compare enlightenment experiences. It's the same thing. I can't compare my happiness to your happiness. I can't compare my depression to your depression. I can't compare my, I don't know, my feelings of injustice in the world to your feelings of injustice in the world. I don't know. So there's a chance that my depression is more manageable than yours. I don't know. It's pretty severe. It's pretty serious. I, I can remember uh, having the thoughts of, of offing myself when I was in grade school, like third or fourth grade. So this is this goes back a long time. That's what I can remember. It probably you know goes back even further than that. So this is something that, that, that I've had to deal with for a long time that I still deal with today. So the, the Zen practice hasn't fixed it or made it go away, but it has given me some tools to manage it with. But those managing it takes, just like my friend Bob has to put in a lot of effort to remember to uh, eat certain things and not eat certain things and to check his, he checks his uh, blood sugar all the time and he take, you know, does exercise, etc. So it, it's, it's that kind of effort that's required. And if you're not willing to put in that kind of effort, you'll probably be better off with the medications. But as I said right at the beginning of the video, I think Kensho, if, when it comes to Kensho experiences, I, I doubt it's affected by the medication. The, the only reason I said it might be affected by the medication is, again, personal experience. I've had friends who have been on antidepressants who've told me the effects the antidepressants had on them. And it's things like brain fog and a feeling of lethargy or a feeling of being really hyper. I've heard these stories from, from people that I've known pretty well. And when I read the, I told you about, uh, if you watched the previous video, I talked about getting uh, prescribed some kind of antidepressant for headaches. And uh, that was some of the side effects that were warned about, were, were cognitive side effects where you would feel like you can't think straight and you, you, you can't uh, function. So thinking about that, I thought, well, maybe that would have an effect on whether you would notice a Kensho experience or not. But I'm just theorizing at that point. I, I don't really know. I just, it, it, it seems like you got to keep your body and mind in a kind of order, um, you know, keep everything kind of in tip-top shape in order for this to occur. I don't say tip-top shape, but at least uh, at least you're not, um, you know, messing with it too much. But again, I don't know, maybe maybe I'm wrong. <laughs> maybe the, the side effects my friends were reporting weren't uh, really happening, or maybe they were on the wrong dose or, or whatever. I don't know. So there you go. Your mileage may vary, as they say in the TV commercials. At least over here, what's it, what, how do Europeans say mileage? You know, the 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 in your in your car, the amount of uh, the amount of uh, 
gas uh, amount of petro petrol that your car uses per, do they call it kilometerage? This I want to know. Okay, as I said yesterday, I am thinking about doing a book of answering questions. So if you've got questions, you can either put them in the comments, which I try to read all the comments, but if they get a lot of comments, sometimes I don't read all of them, but I read most of them. Or if you want to send your question directly to me, you can go to bw or, or send an email to bw at hardcorezen.info. That is my email address. And the other thing I'm going to say is I survive on your donations. So if you want to keep me from getting too depressed, you can go send a donation to uh, hardcorezen.info slash donate. That is hardcorezen.info slash donate. That isn't where you send the donations. That's where you find the links to my PayPal and Patreon accounts where you can send the donations. So I appreciate your donations. But as always, you don't got to support me if you don't want to support me. We will see you next time. Have a good time all the time. Don't get too depressed. Here's a little bit of Ziggy to help you not get depressed. Ziggy, were you warning me that there was something in the back of the house? Yeah, I went and go checked it. I go and went and checked. I went and checked it, and I didn't find anything. So everything's okay, Ziggy. So you can relax. All right, buddy. Is that good? You think you can relax now? <laughs> okay. We'll talk to you later, Ziggy.